Welcome to the KingCast, presented by the King Economics Division of the Social Sciences Department. I'm your co-host, Jack Zipper. With me to here today is my co-host, Mr. Roche. Mr. Roche, it is nice to be back. Jack, finally, we got we got started on the KingCast. I think this is our fifth season. Uh, we've had a little delay getting started. You know, our students have been busy. You've been having a lot of crew stuff on the weekends. We try to record on the weekends. Uh, we didn't get a lot of student interest this year, but I'm glad to be back with our first King cast. We're a little late, but it's still going to be great. Yeah, as always, we are so excited to be back for another King cast. This week's episode is the October monthly economic report and a check on the November 8th elections. Our guest today is John Harrison from the Upper School of History Department, and let's get right into it. Mr. Roche, the economy is bumping along near recession as we approach year end. What did we find out about growth in October? Well, it's been uh, it's been a mixed year so far for GDP growth. We started the year with essentially recessions in, in the first and second quarters. Economy kind of stalled on us there. Uh, we've turned to growth, thankfully, in the third quarter, which is good news. And we'll have to see what develops as we move along, of course. Real GDP increased at an annual rate of 2.6% in the third quarter. This took us out of recession as Q1 real GDP was down 1.6 and Q2 was down 0.6. And for the year, we're only up 0.13% in GDP growth. So not good. Obviously, we're bumping along near recession. The increase in real GDP reflected increases in exports, consumer spending, non-residential fixed investment, federal government spending, and state and local government spending. These are partly offset, Jack, to some extent by decreases in residential fixed investment and private inventory investment. The increase in exports reflected increases in both goods and services. Within the exports of goods, the leading contributors to the increase were industrial supplies and materials and non-automotive capital goods. Within export of services, the increase was led by travel and other business services. Within consumer spending, Jack, we saw an increase in services led by healthcare, which was partly offset by a decrease in goods led by motor vehicles and parts, as well as food and beverages. The increase in federal government spending was led by defense spending, not surprising given what's going on with Ukraine. The increase in state and local government spending primarily reflected an increase in compensation of state and local government employees. Within residential fixed investment, Jack, the leading contributors to the decrease were new family single constructions and brokers' commissions. The decrease in private inventory investment primarily reflected a decrease in retail trade. That's a quick rundown on GDP, Jack. Lots of moving parts. We'll have to see how we go. Mr. Roche, what is your near-term outlook for growth? The near-term outlook over the next couple of quarters, Jack, is about the same. Bumping along near recession, remember the Fed, is, the Fed is still hiking interest rates, expecting to do more in 2023. We still have a lot of risk factors out there, not one of which is the elections coming up next week. And of course, Russia, Ukraine, uh, still lingering effects of COVID with supply side shocks. So I expect to be somewhere around zero to 1% over the next couple of quarters. And there's lots of forecasters that predict that we'll actually go back to negative GDP growth in Q1 and Q2. Wait for more data. We develop in December and January. We can we confirm that up when we do our next monthly report. All right, Jack. That's a quick little rundown on GDP. Let's talk about the labor market now. Jack, I know you've been watching payroll data for us. What can you tell us about the labor market and the health of the conditions there? Well, total non-farm payroll employment increased by two hundred sixty-one thousand in October, and the unemployment rate rose to 3.7%. Notable job gains occurred in healthcare, professional and technical services, and manufacturing. The unemployment rate is increased by 0.2% to 3.7% in October, and the number of unemployed persons rose by 306,000 to 6.1 million. The unemployment rate has been in a narrow range of 3.5% to 3.7% since March. Among the major worker groups, the unemployment rates for adult women, 3.4%, and whites, 3.2%, rose in October. The jobless rates for adult men, 3.3%, teenagers, 11%, blacks, 5.9%, Asians, 2.9%, and Hispanics, 4.2%, showed little or no change over the month. The number of long-term unemployed, those jobless for 27 weeks or more, was little changed at 1.2 million. In October, the long-term unemployed accounted for 19.5% of all unemployed persons. The labor force, force participation rate at 62.2% and the employment population ratio at 60% were about unchanged 
in October and have shown little net change since early this year. These measures are 1.2 percentage points below their values in February 2020 prior to the coronavirus pandemic. All right, Jack, so good news on the labor market. I mean, we, we are in good shape. We're, we're in a labor market that describes 2% growth, 2.5% growth. Sadly, though, we still haven't quite recovered since the pan pandemic uh, shut down in March of 2020. As you indicated in your comments, uh, we're still about 120,000 jobs below where we were in January of 2020. And so we need some more recovery there. And we can talk about the quality of jobs as well, Jack. Many of the jobs being created over the past several months, and we've created lots of jobs as we bounce back from the pandemic, are mostly in service sectors and relatively low paying jobs. So we can talk about the quality of the jobs. And of course, the fact we haven't quite recovered, but good news generally. And in fact, the good news is very evident in the, our weekly initial claims data. The claims data has been really, really good. Levels we haven't seen since the 70s and 80s. It's been consistent that way. So the layoffs have really stopped for quite some time. For the weekend of October 29th, the advanced figures for seasonally adjusted initial claims was 217,000, a decrease of 1,000 from the previous week's revised level. The previous week's level was revised by 1,000 from 217,000 to 218,000, still very low numbers. The four week moving average was 218,750, a decrease of 500 from the previous week's revised average. The previous week's average was revised up by 250 from 219,000 to 219,250. And the four-week moving average was 1,417,500. Those are people that are still on unemployment benefit insurance, and an increase of 30,000 from the previous week's average of 1,387,500 people. These are people that lost their job through no fault of their own, filed for initial unemployment claims, their insurance, their unemployment benefits, and these, the, the 1.3 million are those that are still claiming those benefits. So good news in the labor market, partly why the Fed keeps raising rates, because the labor market remains reasonably tight. Jack, we've covered growth, we've covered um, uh, labor markets, we have to cover inflation, right? Inflation has been the big story for the past year and a half, ever since President Biden took control in January 2021 and shut down uh, our oil sector and natural gas sector to some extent. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about inflation. Yeah, inflation has been flashing red for some time now, Mr. Roche, as we come to year end. Has the price level peaked? Well, I think the second derivative of the rate of inflation, so the rate of change of the rate of change for our inflation rate is negative. So prices are rising at a decreasing rate, which is a good sign, but we still have lots of inflation out there and no sign that the price level is going to peak out and turn down. That could be a, a very long process. The price index we get from a, a few sources. We can identify the inflation from the GDP series, which is a very broad series. We get it from the CPI, and of course, we get it from the PPI, the Consumer Price Index and the Producer Price Index. So we have a bunch of variables to look at, and they're all showing the same things, ongoing inflation, but a little better. The price index for gross domestic purchases increased by 4.6% in the third quarter compared to an increase of 8.5% in the second quarter. And that reflects that second derivative change there that I was talking about. The personal consumption expenditure price index, the PCE, increased 4.2% compared with an increase of 7.3% in the prior quarter. Again, good news, but still elevated. Excluding food and energy prices, the PCE price index increased 4.5% compared to an increase of 4.7% in the second quarter. Jack, that's the GDP series. How about the consumer price index? What's that showing us? Well, the consumer price index for all urban consumers, CPIU, rose 0.4% in September on a seasonally adjusted basis after rising 0.1% in August. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported today over the last 12 months, the all items indexed increased 8.2% before seasonal adjustment. Increases in shelter, food, and medical care indexes were the largest of many contributors to the monthly seasonally adjusted all items increase. These increases were partly offset by a 4.9% decline in the gasoline index. The food index continues to rise, increasing 0.8% over the month as the food at home index rose 0.7%. The energy index fell 2.1% over the month as the gasoline index declined, but the natural gas and electricity indexes increased. All right, so some mixed good news there, Jack. We like to see that gasoline index fall. Of course, every one of us go to the, the gas pump and get our gas and we, we kind of can feel that pinch 
Of course, Democrats are very concerned about gas prices at the, at the gasoline station because of the election coming up. So that's good news for us. But of course, natural gas and electricity prices remain elevated. All right, Jack, checking on the producer side with the producer price index. For final demand, it increased 0.4% in September. Final demand prices declined 0.2% in August and 0.4% in July. So a little reversal of that trend. On an unadjusted basis, Jack, the index for the final demand advanced 8.5% for the 12 months ended in September. In September, two thirds of the increase in the index was for final demand can be traced to a 0.4% increase in the rise for final demand services. That's the things we finally consume as, as uh, producers. And the index for final demands for good advanced 0.4%. So a little bit of good news, we're getting some decreased pressure on prices. Again, that second derivative is turning negative, but we're still, we still haven't gotten out of this mess yet. Remember the Fed has a target around 2% on an annual, annual basis. So we're still well above that. All right, Jack, let's talk about trade. You can see, Jack, we're going right through our, our GDP equation, right? C, I, G, and net exports. Exactly. That's kind of how you evaluate the big picture of the economy. So, Jack, when we talk about GDP, we're talking about consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. What did we learn in October about our trade balance? The U.S. Census Bureau and the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis track trade data. Recent reports show that goods and services deficit was $70.3 billion in September, up $7.6 billion from the $65.7 billion in August. And the goods only deficit topped $92 billion again. September exports were $258 billion, $2.8 billion less than August exports. September imports were $331.3 billion, $4.8 billion more than August imports. The September increase in the goods and services deficit reflected an increase in the goods deficit of $6.6 billion to $92.7 billion and a decrease in the services surplus of $1 billion to $19.5 million. Year to date, the goods and services deficit increased $125.6 billion or 20.2% from the same period in 2021. Exports increased $378.1 billion dollars or 20.2%, imports increased $503.6 billion, or 20.2%. Imports of goods increased $2.9 billion to $270.2.9 billion in September. Capital goods increased $3.3 billion, with semiconductors increasing $1.1 billion, civilian aircraft increasing $0.8 billion, and telecommunications equipment increasing $0.7 billion. Billion consumer goods increased 1.1 billion. Cell phones and other household goods increased 1.4 billion. Pharmaceutical preparations increased 1.4 billion. And finally, industrial supplies and materials decreased two billion dollars, with fuel oil decreasing 0.8 million dollars, crude oil decreasing 0.5 billion, and other petroleum products decreasing 0.5 billion. Jack, I'm exhausted just listening to that. That was a lot of billions of dollars. <laughs> Holy cow, I'm so sorry I put you through that. <laughs> I should have read that through myself before we, we created our script. That was a <laughs> lot of dollar signs. Well done, buddy. But important information, right? These are the little details that policymakers really look at, that traders really look at, investors really look at, that rarely do we, you and I as laymen, of course, our teachers in our school and fellow students look at. So really good information to share with the school for sure. Um, okay, so now let's check on productivity, another critically important uh, metric for deciding the health of the economy. Of course, if you look at average labor productivity as one metric, it's the key metric for defining um, standard of living increases over hundreds of years. And so productivity is very important for us. Let's check in on productivity, Jack. Mr. Roche, we are learning about productivity in AP economics. Why is it so important and how is productivity today? Jack, I think we just started this chapter 30, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we're talking about productivity, the importance of it in, the, in our Keynesian ADAS model. And so um, it's important for us because it, it represents increases in wages, represents increases in productivity, represents efficiency, the efficient use of scarce natural resources. And so productivity today is a little weak. Non-farm business sector labor productivity increased 0.3% in the third quarter of 2022. As output increased 2.8% and hours work increased 2.4%. The same quarter a year ago, non-farm business sector labor productivity decreased 1.4%, reflecting a 1.9% increase in output and a 3.4% increase in hours worked. The 1.4% uh, 
fourth quarter decline is the first instance of three consecutive declines in this measure since 1982. And that's the bad news on productivity. Of course, we, we can have all kinds of things connected with COVID lockdowns to describe that, that problem. Labor productivity or output per hour is calculated by dividing an index of real output by an index of hours worked by all persons, including employees, proprietors, and unpaid family workers. So a complex number to determine, and again, total output divided by total inputs, output per hour is what we're at here. An important measure of efficiency will not quite up to our most efficient standards as we've as we heard since 1982. All right, Jack, let's move along and talk about the Federal Reserve. Inflation has been the big story all year. Democrats are very concerned about it as we approach election on Tuesday. The Federal Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve that sets interest rates, I had a two-day meeting this past week, Jack. Uh, they concluded with, as we expected, with rate hike. So, Jack, um, they raised the rates as expected. What did they have to say about their actions and the outlook in their statement? The Fed, led by Jerome Powell, said recent indicators point to modest growth in spending and production. Job gains have been robust in recent months, and the unemployment rate has remained low. Inflation rates remains elevated, reflecting supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic, higher food and energy prices, and broader price pressures. Russia's war against Ukraine is causing tremendous human and economic hardship. The war and related events are creating additional upward pressure on inflation and are weighing on global economic activity. The committee is highly attentive to inflation risks. The Federal Open Market Committee anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. In determining the pace of future increases in the target range, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation and economic and financial developments. In addition, the committee will continue reducing its holdings of treasury securities and agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities as described in the plans for reducing the size of Federal Reserve's balance sheet that were issued in May. The committee is strongly committed to returning inflation to its 2% objective. Now, my question for you, Mr. Roche, is yes, what do you think of current Fed policy, and do they take some blame for the high rates of inflation? I'm, a, uh, I'm on board current Fed policy. I don't think they should slow down the rate hikes. I think we should get up to 4.5% in the federal funds rate before they slow that down. We're only 50 basis points away, so I'm looking for another move in December or January. Uh, and yes, the Fed does have to take blame for the current inflation environment we're, we're in. There's a bunch of variables. There's Russia and Ukraine. There's the Democrats' fiscal policy, of course. Uh, but the Fed is printing too much money. They, they really injected a huge amount of money during the COVID years after having done so for the prior eight years. The Fed's quantitative easing policy and their zero interest rate policy really are contributors here. And the Fed has got themselves in a the box. So do they keep bringing out inflation in risk recession and then tarnish the reputation as inflation fighters? They're in a box right now. This reminds me of 81, 82 when Paul Volcker was Fed chair. All right, Jack, moving on to fiscal policy. We have to take a look at fiscal and monetary policy, of course. These policies seem to be working against each other. We have contractionary monetary policy. We have expansionary fiscal policy. That is never a good match. How is Congress doing spending our money, Jack? Well, the most recent data we have shows a September budget deficit of $430 billion. The federal budget deficit was $1.4 trillion in the fiscal year of 2022, about half of last year's deficit of $2.8 trillion. Revenues were $850 billion dollars or 21 percent higher and outlays were 548 billion dollars or eight percent lower than they were in the fiscal year of 2021 revenues in all major categories but notably individual income taxes were greater than they were in the fiscal year of 2021 spending related to the coronavirus pandemic declined particularly for the recovery rebates also known as economic impact payments, which included unemployment compensation. Programs of the Small Business Administration, SBA, and transfers to state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. The increase in outlays primarily stems from the $426 billion in costs 
estimated and recorded by the administration in September 2022 to reflect the long-term cost of certain forms of student debt relief, including forgiving portions of federal student loans for many borrowers. The largest policy change, student debt forgiveness, was announced in August. In accordance with the Federal Credit Reform Act, the full multi-year cost of those actions are recorded upfront on a percent value basis. That amount does not include the costs of the proposed new income-driven repayment plan also announced in August. That cost will be recorded when the plan is finalized. All right, Jack, that's a mouthful. Fiscal policy is not in good shape. We have massive deficits by the administration spending money like crazy. The student loan program, which is a debatable program, whether it's legal or not to do what he's doing, already up above the $300 million projected of $426 billion. We haven't even started actually forgiving loans yet. So a little scary there. And I apologize for the generational wealth uh, theft, Jack. All right, buddy, let's finish off with a quick look at markets, Jack. Tell me about stocks. So the S&P 500 opened the month at 3,725 and closed the month at 3,770, up 45 points or 1.2%, with a high of 3,901 and a low of 3,583. What's going on in the bonds market? Fixed income, Jack, the 10-year treasury, our benchmark, opened the month at 3.6%, closed the month at 4.16% higher, with a high of 4.63% and a low of 3.6%. Expect the 10 year rate to continue to go higher. How about FX? Well, at foreign exchange, the US dollar index opened the month at 110.76 and closed the month at 110.76. So unchanged. But the index has a high of 113.32 and a low of 109.70. What do you have to say about that, Mr. Roche? I say King Dollar Reigns, baby. King Dollar Reigns. All right, Jack, finish up with just a look at commodities. We'll pick oil this, this week for the, for the monthly review. West Texas Intermediate opened the month at 87.27 per barrel with a high on the month of $92.60. The low was $82.82 and closed the month at the high of $92.60. Not good. Not good. As we approach winter, that's not good. All right, Jack, great rundown. Um, I'm, I'm excited to do these monthly economic reports. I think it's really important for us. But now we have a nice little segue. We have a nice segue to talk about politics. And it's time to introduce our guest. Our guest today is Mr. John Harrison. John Harrison is a new teacher at King. John hopefully has a picture. Uh, there he is. Yes. Hello, hello. hello. Harrison, good morning. Good morning. How are Welcome you? The King cast. Thank you very Great much. Welcome, you. Mr. Harrison. Thank uh, you. Nice to see you. John, uh, Jack Zipper is with us today. Hello, Jack. Good to see hello. you. And I was just introducing you, John, as our new teacher in the history department. Uh, well liked, lots of fan of Harrison in the new school. Uh, John, you're also helping us out in the, in the economics division, teaching AP economics course, which we can't thank you enough for. Thank you so much. Oh, I assume they're paying you, so I guess I'll have to thank you. Uh, but John, we wanted to bring you on because you and I have had some great conversations over the past month or two about elections and what's going on in the election world. We don't have a lot of time to talk about that in school, so I thought we'd address a little bit with you here on the KingCast. Sure. So we have a bunch of questions for you, John. I know you have some expertise in this area, so maybe you can shine some light on things for us. John, let's just start off generally. Give us an update on the, on the local races, Connecticut and New York. What's going on in sure, the state local right. races? So in both Connecticut and New York, we have governors on the ballot. Uh, Governor Hochul, the incumbent, is on the ballot running against Republican Lee Zeldin. And in Connecticut, incumbent Ned Lamont is running against Republican Bob Stefanski. Um, and in both those races... Uh, they have tightened quite a bit in the polls over the last few months. Uh, most polls predict that Lamont will probably win. Um, he has a pretty sizable lead over Stefanski. Stefanski has run for governor before, back in 2018. Um, so he's sort of a known quantity. Um, but Lamont has a pretty strong organization. And, and Connecticut is uh, overwhelmingly a Democratic state in terms of registration. The New York race with Governor Hochul and Congressman Lee Zeldin is a much more uh, close race. Um, Hochul had been leading in the polls early in the year, but Zeldin has closed it considerably. And so now most analysts believe that the New York governor's race is a toss up. Um, and this is quite surprising, given the fact that New York state, in terms of voter registration, is overwhelmingly Democratic. 
Um, and then in the House and Senate races, those are far less interesting. In Connecticut, Senator Richard Blumenthal, who's a native of Greenwich, is running against Lenora Levy. He's got a pretty commanding lead. He's an incumbent, will more than likely win. And in New York State, Senator Chuck Schumer, who's the minor, uh, Senate majority leader, um, he is uh, got a pretty commanding lead over Republican Joseph uh, Pinkin. Uh, and then the House race in Connecticut is... Uh, incumbent Jim Himes, who is more than likely going to defeat James Stevenson. So the local race is really the the most interesting race, I would say, is the New York governor's race, which we'll have to see how that turns out. And of course, John, as you know so well, incumbents, especially the longtime incumbents like we, we just talked about, they rarely ever lose, like 95 percent re-election rate for right. not too surprising. Them. Right. Jack, what do you have from Ms. Harrison? So we have governors and state and federal Senate and House seats up for re-election. What races around the country have your yeah. attention? Yeah. Well, the races that I think are most interesting are the Georgia Senate race and the Pennsylvania Senate race. Uh, in Georgia, you have political newcomer Herschel Walker, who's a former college football star, is the Republican nominee, African-American, running against the incumbent, although he's just recently been elected, Raphael Warnack, who uh, was elected in the last cycle. And they he also, African-American, is uh, running as a Democrat. That Georgia race is very, very close. Now, Georgia has historically been a Republican state, although there's always been a question about voter turnout and could Democrats move that state more solidly in the Democratic column. Warnack is a popular figure in the Democratic Party circles. He's a former uh, minister. Uh, um, but Herschel Walker has waged a surprisingly effective campaign, given the fact that he is a relative newcomer. The other race is got a celebrity candidate, and that's the Pennsylvania governor's race, uh, excuse me, Senate race, uh, with um, TV celebrity Mehmet Oz, uh, running as a Republican against um, the Democratic candidate, um, oh, geez, John Fetterman. John, <laughs> John Fetterman. Thank you. I just had a brain cramp there. <laughs> um, that's an open seat. Um, there is no incumbent in that seat. Um, Fetterman has been running a sort of interesting campaign aimed at white working class voters. And Oz has been using his celebrity status to try and uh, up his profile. That race is very, very close. Fetterman suffered a stroke back in um, the spring, and that has affected his ability on the stump in terms of his speaking abilities. Oz has also tried to overcome the challenge that he's not a native Pennsylvanian and that he's recently move to the state. We'll have to see where those two races go. And then there's a whole bunch of other states, Nevada, Arizona, and Wisconsin, where you have incumbents who are really being challenged, Democratic incumbents being challenged, and a Republican incumbent in Wisconsin being challenged. Um, and those are going to be really close races. Why does this matter? This matters in part because the Senate right now is at 50-50 and control of the Senate actually is on a razor's edge. And um, if Republicans take control of the Senate, that will have enormous influences in terms of Biden's ability to move the uh, Democratic agenda forward. Yeah. Mr. Harrison, what are the polls showing and what are your expectations for Tuesday's elections? Well, the polls are showing that the Republicans have really gained a lot since the spring. Many pundits thought that Democrats would do well, given the aftermath of the Supreme Court Dodd decision, which was the decision that overturned Roe v. Wade. However, it appears as though that issue is not cutting with voters the way Democrats had thought. It is pretty much certain that Republicans will win the House of Representatives and I think it's probably a fair bet that they will probably take the Senate as well. Um, the question is really going to be a turnout question. Midterm elections are low turnout events. Most Americans don't vote in midterm elections. So really, it's going to be a question of can the Democrats and the Republicans bring out their base vote? And then we'll have to see. Um, this is a always historically a tough time for an incumbent president's party. Ever since Harry Truman, most incumbent presidents end up losing seats. Barack Obama lost seats and George H. George W. Bush lost seats uh, in their midterm elections. So it wouldn't be surprising, given history, that the Democrats will lose seats. Um, but this is also going to set the stage for the 2024 campaign and where that goes. Yeah. John, we'll get you out of here on this one. 
The Democrats have changed their rhetoric in the past week as we approach the 8th, saying a vote for the GOP is a vote for the end of democracy. Beyond that, what are the Dems running on and what are the Republicans running? Yeah. So the Democrats have really tried to craft their message around the issue of reproductive rights. And that was uh, the coming out of the Dodd decision. Um, however, polling has shown that that decision is probably not going to influence voters as much as they thought. And they've really tried to move more toward being responsive to concerns around crime. Urban crime since the pandemic has gone up. And there are uh, sort of many political leaders who believe that crime is a salient issue. And so uh, Democrats are looking, particularly, say, for example, here in New York, Governor Hochul, to be more responsive to the issues around crime. For Republicans, it's the economy. And that's not a bad choice because that is overwhelmingly, historically, always the issue that Americans vote on. And inflation uh, has been eroding the purchasing power of Americans. And so they have been uh, campaigning on the issue that under the Biden administration, prices, particularly for food and fuel, have gone up considerably. So that's really where those two messages um, hang on. And again, as I mentioned before, it'll be a question over uh, turnout and which voters will show up uh, on Election Day this coming Tuesday. Uh, John, we all go back to the 1990s. Bill Clinton, it's the economy, stupid, right? Uh, right. Kind of the Republicans are grabbing that message uh, the way he had at that time. Right. I do think it's important to note, though, that as anyone who sort of follows economy, the president of the United States doesn't necessarily have much control over prices. The prices are in a free market society determined by the free market. So as much as voters may be wanting to blame inflation on Democrats, it's also important to remember that the economy is a far more complex thing. And it's not simply say, the result of one political party's decisions. These prices that we've been suffering have been the result of a lot of factors in the world, including some political decisions made by the John, government. if I had another hour, I would take that on, and we could have a long debate about that one. Just so you know, earlier on in the show, we did blame Democrats for some of the inflation, but we also blame the Fed. Okay. John, that was fantastic. Thank Very you good. so much for joining us. Nice today. chatting with you guys. Good luck. The first show of the Thanks so much, Mr. Harrison. Harrison. Very, Very good, Jack. Thank you. Campus. Okay. Bye-bye now. Okay, that was John Harrison, history teacher in the upper school history department, great guy, new to the school, and that was some excellent insights for us. Jack, we're long today. Let's get it out of here on our friendly reminders. Do your reading. Do your homework. Come to class prepared. Use your blinker with making turns or switching lanes. Stop signs mean stop. No texting while driving. Always try to buy American. That is it for us. Thank you to John Harrison, our guest for today. Join us again next week, or next month, I should say, and tell your friends and family to listen to the KingCast at kingschoolct.org campus life page. And we're out of here. All right, Jack. Nice job.